You want to find out how fast Big Pharma is becoming more and more interested in psychedelic medicine? It's happening a lot quicker than what you think. Find out now. All right, welcome to the Dale's Report podcast and happy to be joined here today with Dr. Daniel Claw. He joins us here. You are the professor of anesthesiology from the University of Michigan and also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board with Trip Therapeutics. Appreciate you joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, go Blue. Uh, so wanted to have you on, uh, for my viewers that are watching, we uh, wanted to have you on to talk more about the recent headline news about Trip Therapeutics as they announced the filing of a Phase two IND application with the uh, FDA. It's an open-label Phase 2A trial, and it's going to evaluate the efficacy of what's called TRIP-8802, which uh, in translation is an oral formulation of synthetic psilocybin in tandem with psychotherapy. So for the treating of, this is obviously going to be for the treating of fibromyalgia. So walk us through the significance of a company entering into a Phase 2A clinical trial. And do you feel the current research of fibromyalgia is presently underserved? Well, a lot of questions there. Um, I'm, let me answer the first question. I'm really excited about TRIP and, and a number of companies, in fact, being interested in the psychedelic space. I think whether it's in pain or in uh, different neurologic or psychiatric conditions, I think there's a lot of um, sort of promise of psychedelics. And it's sort of accidental that these drugs, you know, in the 80s were, you know, made Schedule One drugs and, and we sort of stopped doing research on therapeutic potential of these compounds, even though there were a lot of sort of promising avenues that ended up just not being pursued. And now people are excited and pursuing these again. Going to fibromyalgia, there, there's been so much research in fibromyalgia and related conditions that the International Group of Pain Researchers a couple of years ago formally said, we think there's a third new mechanism of pain where the pain is coming much more so from the central nervous system. And we're, we'll call this nosoplastic pain, which is a mouthful, but it's a, it was a really big deal for the International Group of Pain Researchers to say, we've known about you know, pain that's due to some problem out in the periphery, you damage or inflame a tissue, and we've known about nerve pain forever, but this third mechanism of pain based on all the functional neuroimaging studies and other types of studies that groups like ours have done over the last two or three decades have convinced people that the brain and the central nervous system is capable of sort of causing pain in and of itself without anything wrong out in the periphery. Or, and so fibromyalgia is sort of the poster child for, but, but there's a lot of pain conditions like this. Headache is, for example, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong in someone's head when they have a headache. There's not any damage or inflammation in their head. And there's we're, what we're learning is a lot of the common chronic pain conditions, this plays a sizable role. It might not be like fibromyalgia where it's the major mechanism, but half of people with low back pain, for example, probably have the same mechanism. And so uh, this type of pain might be the most common type of pain we see in humans. So you brought up the idea back in the early 80s with psychedelics in general. There was a lot of research and then it was stalled. What do you think is the biggest difference between today, say, 40 years ago? And why do you think more and more people are just so open to the idea of, like, you know, um, further researching into a lot of these different compounds? What's changed? Well, for one, stigma has. When I give talks, um, I don't give talks about psychedelics yet. I, I assume I'll be talking about that topic more as we do more and more research. But I do give a lot of talks on cannabinoids now, and I always show the reefer madness um, video, the one minute clip from Reefer Madness to show people like what people used to think about um, cannabis and how it was like the evil weed from hell and people were going right. to die if they took it. And so there was a lot of sort of hysteria and it wasn't helped by a lot of the people who were, you know, scientifically working in this area were part of sort of the counterculture, the Timothy Leary types. The um, So the, it it sort of got a reputation as like these are the hippie drugs and these people are a bit out of control and right uh, so but it but it, none of that was really scientifically grounded the science was actually always sort of that this was these were interesting compounds um and they, and it was just again the whole scheduling of all these drugs you know in the late 70s early 80s was a political thing not a you know nothing more than that it, it had no scientific underpinnings 
So do you think uh, psilocybin, which, you know, currently right now is an unproven substance in pain alleviation, can actually stand a good chance of beating endpoints within these specific trials that are going to be conducted? Yes. I think it has a more than good chance. Uh, it'll take a while to unpack. You know, many of us feel as though the, the drugs themselves will probably work okay, but it's more likely that they'll sort of be permissive and allow us to get into the sort of brains of people so that really well-trained therapists can work on the, the therapy that's done before and after the psychedelic experience, I think will actually have more to do with how well the drug works than the drug itself. So it'll be in a way it'll be, this may be a bad analogy because I don't want to liken it in any way, but to um, a very minor version of, of electroconvulsive therapy where it allows a bit of a reboot um, of the brain and allows sort of like um, people to, open up to new ideas or new thoughts that until that time, it was very difficult for a therapist to sort of get in there and work through some of those problems. So we think this might be particularly helpful in people that have had yeah. a lot of trauma and have pain, you know, in part because of a lot of trauma, things like that, that it yeah. might really be helpful. But we think the secret sauce of this might be this, the, psychotherapy that's done along with it. And I know Tripp thinks that way and we do that we're really doing a lot of work in parallel, not just on the compounds we're administering, but thinking through that this is a real therapeutic opportunity with respect to giving therapists the ability to do things that maybe they've never really been able to do very well before. Yeah, makes sense. You are, uh, you know, a professor of, as I said before, of anesthesiology and psychiatry at the University of Michigan, but you're also you serve as the director of Chronic Pain and Fatigue Research Center, and you're viewed amongst the uh, medical community as a leader and expert in pain conditions in fibromyalgia. When we look at psilocybin and we fast forward five years from now, what kind of placement do you think this will have in the medical field? I hope it's a therapeutic option for individuals and that they can make a choice. Do they want to go this route or do they want to go some of our classic drugs or do they want to really focus on using other non-pharmacologic therapies, which are also increasing at evidence base, you know, the, the two biggest things that have happened in my career in pain are the advent of this third mechanism of pain, which our group had something to do with, and the evidence base for acupuncture, yoga, mindfulness, Tai Chi, these therapies that we used to be really dismissive of in Western medicine, um, they can all be really helpful and really effective. And so that's Another sort of challenge is how we um, offer these therapies to people, these integrative therapies to people and surround the chronic pain patient with access to a number of different therapeutic options other than just hitting them over sledgehammer with opioids. Yeah, that's obviously a growing concern. Um, and it's, it's, I find it interesting for someone like you who, who mentions that because you've been involved in three different phase study, which eventually led to the FDA approval of drugs for the treatment of fibromyalgia, which in translation means you're obviously well-versed in what the current drug treatment landscape looks like. Saying that, um, do you believe current medications are inadequate? And if so, why? Well, they're very inadequate. They, they work at best in one out of three individuals, each of them. But that's the, in the whole pain space. We don't really have any drugs in any chronic pain condition that work in, in trials in more than about a third of the people that get them. So this is just a, a broader problem in the pain field. It's not a fibromyalgia-specific problem, but there's huge unmet need in the field of chronic pain. And again, one of the problems in the U.S. Mm -hmm. medical system is that um, there's a lot of surgery done for chronic pain that is not done in other countries um, and probably shouldn't be done. But because people are desperate, they you know have a lot of back surgery and a lot of other surgery that simply is rarely, if ever, done in other countries because the evidence base for that surgery really working and being effective is low. So there's a lot of money spent um, on chronic pain patients, on disability wow. costs and things like that. And I think we just got to channel that into the therapies that are more effective and away from the, um, again, that was one of the reasons that opioids got such a foothold is that a lot of providers are sort of flummoxed yeah. by managing pain and opioids were just something simple to do, you know, give them a bunch of Vicodin and send them home and they're not going to bother me for another month. It wasn't ever doing anything. It was just trying to sort of cover up the problem. Do you think uh, big pharma, of course, they're going to eventually get into this industry. Do you think it'll happen a lot sooner rather than later with what's been going on as far as the development of research? 
I don't know, because this is so unlike what big pharma typically does. You know, a, a big company, I, I won't name the company, but I work with most of them that are still doing drug development, and they'd come in and want to do a trial, the regular parallel design trial and everything. And you have to be more innovative in in these designs and mm -hmm. thinking through. And the, the FDA is likewise going to have to be accepting of something other than the sort of classic parallel group trials because there's it's not that easy to blind someone as to whether they're having a psychedelic experience or not you can you know you can give them something that might give them a some sort of experience but we're it's going to have to be sort of a lot of negotiations with the agency and sponsors about what level of proof they're going to require um but that's why the study that we're doing with trip we're doing a lot of the, the, the expense of that study is the functional MRI, the EEG, the other things that we're doing pre and post treatment so that if we see a positive therapeutic response and the people improve, we'll want to likewise see the hypothesized improvements in EEG and functional MRI that we would expect to see if this was really working the way we hope it works. And if we saw the clinical improvement without those corresponding MRI or EEG improvements, at least, again, I, I will just say those of us on the scientific side, the TRIP people can think whatever they want to think, we'd be less um, right. able to say that's a real response rather than a placebo response. But it's why we actually think that we don't need a placebo group for these early trials because we can tell with the imaging and the EEG, whether people got better or not. And that will help us um, really understand, you know, that these drugs are working, that we're seeing really dramatic changes in the networks, functional networks and things like that, that we anticipate happening. And again, really early studies that were done or that have been done, you know, in the last year or so since some of these controls have been loosened a little bit, um, are just really promising with respect to what we might see in the brain when we give someone one of these drugs, uh, how it will almost sort of open up um, brain networks and make more accessible, um, I'll say right. again, you know, therapy and yeah. things like that, that might really end up being the secret sauce. It might be that the, and again, I don't know of a pharma yeah. company that is used to, you know, try to uh, doing a combined therapy plus drug you know, um, that this just isn't the way they've classically operated. It would, it would make my head explode to, for example, how, and again, this is nothing negative right. about Pfizer, but how a Pfizer type company could come in and use all their SOPs and things with, a, you know, a compound in a development program like this. I think it's, it is more tailored to the smaller biotech pharma companies like trip and, and they may own this space for quite a while until something is actually approved. And then, someone in big pharma yeah. will step up to co-market it. But um, I don't, I don't, I don't know you if they'll co-develop it. Yeah. But you could see that eventually coming though, correct? Oh, certainly at the marketing side, they're going to, yeah. If they think that no. they can, I don't, but again, I don't know. I would say they might step in for the second phase three trial. Um, but that I, I don't see them stepping in really early because it's just so unlike the, no. the, the classic drug development pathways. Well, it's incredible, the industry. I was speaking to a doctor two weeks ago, and he was mentioning about how there was one clinical trial annually 15 years ago, <laughs> and now look where we're at. Like, it's it's tremendous pace as to where it's going. It truly is fascinating, but uh, a lot of optimism that everybody I speak with, but it's still obviously very early. Uh, last thing I wanted to ask, and before I exactly how the psilocybin will work, and I know you've mentioned a few things as to how, you know, it'll open up different receptors. Uh, the one thing I have learned when prepping for this interview was many people may not be aware of is that severe pain sensations can occur in the human brain and as a result can trigger pain signaling processes that aren't connected with current trauma. So first off, can you explain into detail what that means? Well, I mean, a, a good example would be most people are familiar with phantom limb pain where an individual can be experiencing pain in a limb that no longer exists. So that is sort of telling you that the brain in and of itself is capable of having pain. In fact, it's the only organ you need to have pain. Um, there's other kinds of like post-stroke pain and things like that. So what we're just talking about right. here really is, is more specifically targeting the brain and the central nervous system. And, and I'm not sure which of the mechanisms 
that psychedelics, if you will, deploy neurobiologically, whether it's the, you know, the serotonin receptor, the 5-H2 receptor. I actually, if I had to guess, I would hypothesize it's the way it really changes the con connectivity in the brain and some of the networks that sort of there's connections between networks that are not no, no, normally there in a conscious awake individual while they're having a trip. And, um, and then again, I think afterwards, we, we may be able to, you know, if you will, restore a good set of networks, because that's a lot of what we're seeing in chronic pain is there's, there's connectivity between brain regions that normally don't t talk to each other. And if we could get these brain regions in some way to stop talking to each other, that might be therapeutically advantageous. Hmm. Well, it's it's interesting to see how this is all going to work. There's still, like I said, early stages. There's a lot of stuff that we don't really understand. But I, I just find it incredible when you talk about how the human brain currently is wired, how it works, what are some of the things that obviously we have as far as alternatives and solutions. But most importantly, too, I look at just the favorable feedback that we're getting within this industry and how it will change the overall health uh, care landscape moving forward uh, obviously has tremendous growth for this industry, do you not think? Yeah, absolutely. And going back to what I said earlier about, you know, how we used to be dismissive of therapies like acupuncture and, and it, all sorts of different things that I mentioned, um, you know, there similarly have been cultures that forever have used psychedelics as part of rituals and things like that. And and people that have used them I know. With, with, with safety and with success and things like that. And I think that's why there's excitement in the investment community and in the, and almost in the lay public, because I think people, it has what we in science call face validity, that, that they might be helpful. Well, a lot of people reading a lot of information online. I'm not saying that's always helpful, but uh, there's a lot of people that question Western medicine. I'm not saying it's all wrong, but does it need to be tweaked a little bit? And I think the answer is yes, but stuff like this obviously is presenting those changes, do you not think? Absolutely, but it's tweaking them in a, you know, it's not trying to blow everything up. It's it's It really is more tweaking rather right. than, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It's saying, yeah, there may be drugs that can be very effective, but it maybe they're not the same business model as our current drugs where someone has to keep taking it a long period of time for you to generate a profit as a drug company. This is a di an entirely different sort of business model for a company, if you think of it, because, you know, it's going to be a couple doses of, of a drug wrapped with a, a lot of other things around it that are going to be necessary for both safety and efficacy. So, um, again, that is a yeah. markedly different sort of development program. And we we like working with the smaller biotech companies because they tend to be more sort of scientifically driven rather than marketing driven. So this is fun for us. It's not like we don't like it's working just, with the bigger companies, but the smaller companies are, uh, again, more willing to take risk. It's what you went to school for and what you've learned, right? Of course. Yeah. Doing trials the same yeah. way they've been done yeah. for 30 years, yeah, the, well, they, like the big companies do. Anyone can yeah. do that. That's not very fun. Isn't it great? Wow. We're actually doing research based on what we should be focusing on, not necessarily the almighty dollar, which I think we've come to a crossroads in society. I think COVID's really peeled off the Band-Aid to a lot of things and how people are reevaluating things. But uh, needless to say, uh, very informative, um, very interesting to see, obviously, the uh, phase two trials with uh, TRIP. And uh, the announcement from last week, but I appreciate you giving us uh, an update and uh, outlining all the things um, that uh, we'll be uh, looking for with regards to the trials. I appreciate your time, Dr. Klopp. Likewise. Good talking to you. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And make sure to like this video and please feel free to leave a comment. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on the notifications bell to receive all new videos posting featuring stocks that are moving into crypto, psychedelic and cannabis space, and also notifications on monthly cash giveaways. You don't want to miss it. Thanks, everyone.